Well, hello everybody and Happy New Year. So to kick off 2021, I wanted to update everybody on you know, Rogue of Valis and talk a little bit about RPGs, RPG stats, and bosses. And you know, I, I opened with the introduction sequence of the first boss, and I'm pretty happy with that, actually. Um, it's one of the very first bosses I've ever made, or maybe I should say proper bosses. You know, typically when I make games, I just have you know a normal enemy with higher stats, and that's the boss. But I wanted something a little bit more, you know, what you would expect to see in this kind of game. So what I wanted to talk about today is not so much how to program these kinds of bosses, but rather more from the design perspective, what thoughts go into creating a boss for an action role-playing game, which is you know, what I consider this game to be. So what I would like to do is talk about that a little bit, and then at the end of the video, I will show you know, the actual battle to you know, wrap up the, the introduction. So yeah, uh, stick around and you know, we'll talk about some of these things. So first of all, the level. So you can see here, I have finally fixed the UI for this. You now you can select a level just by you know moving through the buttons and then press enter to actually select it. So this is new technology, and I have a little bit of a spoiler in the icon. I think I need to draw the icon again. Um, I like that icon though, but I don't want to give away what the boss looks like. Oops. Oh yeah, I also added a few things. So this is. This is the other perspective of, of boss. So typically, the boss in the video game is kind of your, um, ooh, I kicked him right across that. You know, it's typically, you know, the final battle, but it's also kind of a test for me as well on some of the decisions I've made designing this game. And what I mean by that is, you know, I've thought about how to design this game in a variety of different ways, and I get to a point where I think, have I made the right decisions? And by the time I you know, got up to implementing the boss, that was my first sign that, you know what, I think I'm actually on the right track with this. Um, I've, just, I've made a couple decisions I think might be somewhat controversial, but at the same time, I think they work pretty well. At least they work so far, I should say it that way. It's working so far, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, although, you may have you may have noticed that you know I've mentioned a, a couple times before you know what I've been doing and where I've been coming from. Well, I want to point this out too. Oh, I can't get it. You can. Oh, I need to get out here. I messed that up. Well, <laughs> I think this would be a, a nice little segue to part two. Um, RPG stats. If I have any advice for anyone that wants to make an ARPG or RPG or any kind of you know variant of a role-playing game, what are your important design tools? Well, let me show you what I consider to be one of the most important tools you have. That's right, spreadsheets. So, uh, kind of anticlimactic, I think, but at the same time, RPGs are more so than a lot of other games I can think of are all about numbers and balance and trying to get you know different character stats balanced with each other. Uh, it's very easy to make things too easy or make things too hard. If the game's too easy, players get bored. If they get if it's too hard, they give up. So what you're looking at here is probably the most important statistic in the game: experience points. And this is the part that I think may be kind of controversial. The way I've set up experience in this game is in, in a way that I'm hoping avoids grinding. Let me illustrate. Okay, so I'm going to pull up the game and show you the map. I think probably the easiest way to get to the map is just going to be the suicide. So. You can see I have the level under construction. You know, the green blocks there is just my sketching. Once I'm happy with the layout of a level, I'll go back and actually, you know, add the decorations. But uh, for now, you know, it's just green squares. So we'll accept fate and go back to the map. So the map. 
the way I've set up experience, you see there's a high score here. So, you know, the score in the upper right corner is not just points, it's your experience that you can spend to gain new skills. And the way this works is your experience points are based off of your high score in the level. So you can see here, I have a pretty good score for you know the very first level. You know, twenty-six thousand nine hundred is pretty close to the maximum number of points that you can possibly get. So this is the part that I think might be kind of weird at first. If you replay a level, you don't get those points. You only gain experience when you beat your high score. Now this is handled live, so what I mean by that is. You know, if I replay that level, as soon as I hit 26,901 points, now I'm starting to gain experience. So in order to gain experience, I have to beat my high score in a level. Now the reason why I did this is grinding. And this is the part of RPGs that I really don't like that much. I read an interesting thing by Jeff Vogel which those of you who don't know who that is, he is the author of the Exile series and uh, much more, but I'm more familiar with Exile. So this is Exile. Uh, it's, if you grew up in the 90s or even the 80s, I think, you know, these were the typical RPGs of the time, at least you know, the tile-based, you know, maybe I shouldn't say typical of the time, but it's what I was used to. Um, Vampire is actually one of the first ones I can remember playing on DOS, um, but Exile was far more involved and deep uh, than I was used to from you know, some of the, the DOS games that me and my brother played, and we really got into Exile. Um, this is actually one of the few shareware games that we actually registered. Of course, it was Exile 3. Um, we actually never played to the end of Exile 1. <laughs> There's kind of a sad story behind that. You know, we had this on our 386, and well, my dad's 386, and uh, one day a lightning storm caused a brownout, <laughs> and it fried that poor computer. So that was the end of Exile. We never got to see the end of it. Of course, we didn't have the full version anyway, so I'm sure at some point we would have hit you know, the shareware chasm or whatever, you know, they had to break the game in half. But one of the interesting things about this, I stumbled upon this years later, <clears throat> Jeff Vogel, the, the author, wrote a piece for, I remember what it was called, um, one of the game magazines or PC magazines, maybe it's IGN, I don't know. Um, I want to see if I can find that, and maybe I'll post a link to it in the description of the video if I can find it. But he opened up by saying that he hates RPGs, which is a funny thing because he's spent a lot of time making them. Um, I think the Avernum series is one of his more well-known. Of course, there are many, many more as well. But I read his thoughts on RPGs, and I got to thinking that, you know, I really have a lot of the same feelings about this. And, you know... I'm, I sat down and played Exile for a little bit, and it's fun, but I'm thinking about what he wrote in that article, and I'm thinking that, you know, here's the problem with RPGs, time. It, they demand a lot of time, and, you know, RPGs are mainly about starting off weak and growing strong, as opposed to, uh, I'm, I'm trying to quote him, uh, I can't quote him directly, but... His thing was that, you know, in other games, you know, for example, first-person shooters, you often start off strong. So RPGs are about growth. And that's usually accomplished by spending hours upon hours of game time growing, <laughs> grinding, in other words. And I wanted to avoid that. Okay, so let me come back to my, let me come back to my game now. Um... What have I done different? Well, the reason why I have this high score system is so that I have a finite number of experience points. And because I have a finite number of experience points, that means I can't make the player grind. Now, it seems like at first glance I'm taking something away from the player. You know, I'm taking away their ability to grind. But what that does is it forces me as the developer 
to make sure that I find alternate ways to give the player an effective means to progress. And it's all about trying to keep the play time up because there's a sweet spot. You don't want the game to be you know, defeated very quickly, but at the same time, you don't want it to drag on and on and on. So how do I slow the player down without slowing them down too much, <laughs> if that makes sense? How do I get you know, a, a good length of game? And the way I've approached this, I think it's clever. I'm going to find out, I guess, if it is or not. But I think it's a good idea so far, and I can always refine it if I realize this is completely stupid. But <laughs> what, what I've done is this. Let me go back to my spreadsheet. So what you're looking at here is all of the experience points available in each of the levels. Now I haven't computed how many experience points are available you know, in new technology, but I'm getting scores right now in about 40,000. So there's a very steady progression in how much experience points each level is worth. And if you look, I have three columns. Remember those style bonuses are very important. So, you know, first is an estimate of about the minimum number of experience points a player could earn by beating the level. This would be more or less if they have a D rogue rating. In the middle column is my best estimate of what I would expect a typical player to get if, you know, they maybe repeat the level once or twice or, you know, they're starting to get the hang of the game, you know, that kind of thing. And then in the third column, I have a rough estimate of the best possible score the player could get. Now, it is possible to beat this, uh, so I wouldn't call this you know, the absolute best, but S rank at least. Um, very, very tough to get or exceed the scores in that third column. And what I have to make sure I do is make sure that the experience point cost of reading all the books that falls within a certain range of values between the minimum and the maximum possible score. So basically this is what I want. I want the player to be able to obtain the skills they have to have to proceed very early on. And you can see you know the ones I've mentioned as being essential such as Scout have relatively low costs. You know, it's not hard at all to get 4,000 experience points beating a level. Yeah, it might be hard to get 4,000 points before you beat the level, but you know, even the minimum style bonuses you're likely to get between that and the points you get for just collecting things and killing some of the bad guys will get you 4,000 points. Of course, algebra is another, I, I would almost call that one essential because it's really hard to aim without the dots. And one thing that I've learned with the boss battle is which skills are really necessary to beat the boss and which ones aren't. And there's kind of an inverse relationship between the importance of a skill and its cost. So what I would like is for the player to be able to, in, instead of being a story about how Marika starts off weak and gets strong, I wanted to scale this more how she starts off pretty strong and then gets almost in, in the realm of what you expect a superhero to have, you know, superhuman strength. Uh, I call it the 150% rule. A uh, typical cinematic platformer, you have a character that has reasonable, albeit, you know, very good athletic abilities, and they kind of stay that way. Like, think Prince of Persia. You know, the prince can move around about as you would expect a really strong human to and yeah a really strong human might still have a hard time you know climbing you know five or six stories in a row but you know it, it's more believable than like Mario that jumps six times his height so I wanted Marika to be in that you know kind of gray area between plausibility and a little bit superhuman but then by the end of the game she's more in that super superhuman realm that you typically find in you know comics and that's why I want because I want the player to feel that progression and the other way I've approached this so when you redo a level let me go back to what I said you know when you redo a level you only gain experience points if you beat your high score 
but you can redo a level at any time. And it's possible, you know, to gain all of these skills and then go back to level one and just, you know, blast right through it. And that's going to be the moment, I think, where the player can begin to see just how much they've grown. You know, imagine how much easier level one would be if you could jump 50% higher and you had, you know, super high power weapons. And let me show you an example, actually. We're going to play level one again. And it's not a walk in the park right now. I almost said walk in the cake. <laughs> cake walk, walk in the park. But it's quite a bit easier than it was before. And for no other reason, I have tons of axes. And most of the time when you take damage, it's because you don't have any melee weapons. You don't have any uh, projectile weapons, I should say. Well, I messed that jump up. When you start, but these guys are, you know, no trouble at all. In fact, I also have knives. And by the time I get to this point, not only do I have knives, I also have new abilities I can use the knife for. You know, I can aim. Uh, I can also... You know, just shoot knives as I'm running. You know, all these will be skills eventually. I and mean, this is far, far simpler than it was you know, at the beginning of the game. So, the point is... Let me get that guy real quick so I can concentrate. The point is that... You know, when I say you have to redo a level to... You know, when, I, when I say you have to beat your high score, if you want to redo a level and get more points, then, you know, depending on what you're redoing, it's actually not that hard to beat your high score and get a much better rating. I think the real challenge would be to get, you know, an S or P rank on every level on your first run through. But certainly, you know, if you're just going to redo a level, you know, when you're, you know, let's say you've earned a couple million experience points total, and then you decide to redo a level. It's not going to be that tough. In fact, I'm just, you know, kind of, you know, I've made a couple mistakes. I said, I want the P rank to always be tough. You know, the P rank is picky. You, know, you have to play flawlessly, and that's really hard. But certainly it's not that hard to get, you know, an S or an A rank, even after just, you know, beating four or five levels and getting those skills. I'll wrap this up, we'll see how I did. I might have forgotten something. Yeah, look at that. You know, I've done really well. In fact, I may have beat my high. It looks like I beat my high score actually, because I had what nineteen thousand. Oh, how in the world did I only get a B? You know, I must have missed something. Well, <laughs> anyway, I got more points. You know, your rogue rating doesn't matter as much as your points. Ah, uh, twenty-six nine hundred. Okay. I must have missed something because I was trying to talk and play that at the same time. But you get the idea. It was certainly a lot easier than it was at the beginning of the game. Okay, so back to the spreadsheet. So, you know, here are my experience points. You can see, you know, my performance on level one was really between here and here. So pretty good, actually. So now the, the points. So what I've done is very carefully try to set these books up so that there's a suggested order and the order you read these books is controlled in a couple different ways. So let me go back to balance for a moment because I was talking about balancing RPGs and that's kind of a tough thing to do. Let me share some advice and this is just things I've learned I'm going to share with you. Give yourself some variables. That's probably the most important thing I can think of is give yourself some variables. So one variable I have is intelligence. And intelligence is one of the character stats that you can see right there. So intelligence is based off of the number of experience points you've spent. And the reason I have that statistic is because let's say I have a, a player that finds one of those books that costs a lot of experience. I think Sanctuary is a good example. So there's like a skill called Sanctuary, and what that does is effectively, effectively 
gives you a free hit. So if you take damage for more hit points than you have, normally you would die. But if you have Sanctuary, then your hit points gets rounded down to zero. And then you can take one more hit until you're killed. I've seen a couple games do this to give credit where it's due. I got the idea from Exile, actually, but I think I might be wrong on this, so don't hate me if I get this wrong. I think Final Fantasy does that. I've never played Final Fantasy, so I'm just basing that off of secondhand knowledge, but um, I don't think Exile is the only game that's done that, but I like the idea. So it gives you a free hit, and Towers of Valis does that too. That skill costs a lot of experience. It's 25,000. If I have a player that's just dead bent on getting that skill, and they're saving up experience for that, they're going to miss out on some of the cheaper skills that they have to have at some point in the game. And the boss is a good example. So in order to force the player to buy the easier skills first, I have an intelligence requirement on the Sanctuary book. And I don't think I have the Sanctuary book here. Uh, I do have Vitality, though. And you can see in Vitality, it also has an intelligence requirement. That forces you to have read a certain number of books, or rather, I should say, spent a certain amount of experience points before you can get this, spend them on this skill. So it's a way to force a little bit of... A progression in these books and as the game goes on it's less important that the player read books in certain order at the same time you know there are many more avenues to you know get intelligence up so it's just a control so one of my pieces of, of advice if you're going to make a role-playing game is to give yourself a couple of variables that you can use to try and you know I don't want to say force the players hand in a different direction, maybe take their hand, lead them a little bit in the right way. Uh, the other piece of advice I'd give you is to set up battles. So let me show that off. Okay, so back to the spreadsheets here. This is a spreadsheet for Towers of Valis. This was the isometric game, uh, Game Boy inspired. And you can see this is quite a bit more complex than I had for Rogue of Valis. Of course, with Rogue of Valis, since the actual combat is more arcade style, I don't really need to balance that as much. Um, Towers of Valis was a little bit more in the vein of Diablo, where your character stats such as strength, intelligence, etc., I think play a more direct role in you know, predicting the outcome of a battle. And that's what I have here, is trying to you know, set up different scenarios and try to see you know, what are the limits on the player. So, for example, what I've determined here is that, you see, I can show one of these. Yeah, if the player is in level 5, then with these stats, these are the relative difficulties on a scale of about 1 to 10. In different situations and it's been a while since I've looked at this but I want to say the situations are fighting an enemy one-on-one -on -one, fighting an enemy in a group of three or more and then I can't remember the other two ah um, if they're exhausted so if they what's the probability the player will run out of movement points before the battles over which in Towers of Valis is actually uh, pretty significant, it has some pretty significant consequences. So you can see here is Towers of Valis, and I wanted to illustrate you know, just a little bit about what you're looking at in the spreadsheet. We have to remember how to open that gate. Okay, so combat in Towers of Valis is, as you would expect because of the perspective, significantly different than it is in Rogue of Valis. You can see here, you know, the battles are a little bit more dictated by statistics than arcade skill. Uh, there's still a, you know, much more significant skill element that you would find as compared to games like Exile, but it's still, you know, maybe 30, 70 statistics versus player skill, maybe more 50, 50, um, somewhere in that range anyway. 
So you can imagine, you know, trying to balance all these statistics by playing the game over and over again. You know, that'd be pretty tough to do. But I can, and, and I, I don't want to say, I died. <laughs> I don't want to say you can skip that step, but at the same time, it's easier to try and get it close to balance on the spreadsheet and then fine tune it, you know, in actual testing, as opposed to only using testing and replaying certain battles over and over and over again. So that's advice number two, is to try and you know, set up a way to model different scenarios and get it tuned as close as you can that way. And then once you think you've got it, test those numbers in a live setting and see if you, know, you get the desired results. So, um, I would more or less think that is everything I really have to share for now. Um, in my next update, I, there are a couple things I actually need to take care of before I can move to a different world. So yeah, what I mean by a different world? Let me get out of here real quick. Up until now, the player has been limited to this little quadrant of the map, and I'm ready to move on forward. I hope I'm not being too ambitious with this. Uh, there are, I think, 22 little spots on the map here. Not all of them are going to be levels you can play, like uh, Lurica here is a friendly village. So I haven't set that up as friendly yet, but that's where you're going to be able to find Rada, uh, who's the prisoner in Towers of Valis. And he'll be able to give you some hints as to, you know, where to find certain weapons and certain power-ups and such. But you have to beat the first boss in order to unlock this level, which would be, oh, there's nothing there right now. Uh, that will be, you know, the checkpoint that opens up more of the map. So, yeah, I'm going to take, kind of guide the player a little bit more linearly through these levels, at least the first few. And then the game becomes more non-linear. Uh, it's not completely linear right now. You can beat this level, and then once you talk to Rada, you can you know play the level twos in each act in any order you want. Um, I think I'm going to have have it set up though where act or level three. Let's see here, there, yeah, there's no level three yet. Level three, I'm. I think I'm going to make an optional level, but it has a nice little skill book in it that can help you with the boss battle. And then, of course, level three here is the boss. And then once you beat that, it unlocks this checkpoint, and you can proceed through the rest of the game. So a couple of things I need to do before I can start progressing. I need Rada, first of all, so I need to implement that. And I have a few little bugs that I found. One nice thing about the boss battle and playtesting the boss battle is that it's really shown me what abilities I need to give the player to make it doable. And what I mean by that, let me go back into playtesting real quick. There are a couple things that you can't do, couldn't do up until now, and one of them was throw an X at the same time is moving. You used to have to stop and then you can aim. So, and of course, knives are similar. Oh, I don't have any knives. Is there a knife in here? There's a knife somewhere. Well, knives are similar. Um, you can shoot a knife while you're moving, but you don't have the ability to aim. If you shoot a knife while you're, while you're, um, oh, I just hit myself with my own axe. <laughs> well, anyway, um, it, it, you can you can aim the axe while you're moving, but in order to aim with the knife, you have to stop. And I'm trying to think of where are some real world limits. So the limit on the knife is really more practical. Um, the left and right arrow keys are used to aim the knife, but if you're moving, they're used for moving. So I can't have it you know do two things at once. Anyway, that's all I have for everybody. So. 
Uh, next time I will hopefully have some friendly places to show off, or at least you know a more polished, you know, new construction or new technology zone. Uh, anyway, um, once again, let's let's hope 2021 is better than 2020. Uh, until then, uh, thank you for watching, and see you next time.